diving in and being in touch with themselves and being in touch with the brush, being in touch with the ink, being in touch with the paper. And um, if you don't do that when you do it, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a lie detector test. I mean, it shows exactly how much you do that or don't do that. It's, there's something funny about the Sumi brushes that they're so sensitive that whatever you put into it just comes right out the other end. And which is, of course, good, not bad, because as an artist, you want that sensitivity. But um, at first, it can be a challenge because they're so sensitive. It's sort of like, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever sat down in a sports car for the first time and just stepped on the gas and turned the wheel, but I mean, it just goes, pew, you know, and you're lucky if you don't drive right into the garage because you're used to driving around in, you know, a, an old Chevy or whatever. So, in a way, that's what the Zen brush is like. It's like an extremely fancy sports car. And uh, so you can get hurt. But the beauty of art is it's only your ego that gets hurt. So, uh, no physical injury. These are oil pastels. And it was actually Pablo Picasso who suggested to uh, a man named Sennelier, who was a paint maker in Paris, and said, couldn't you make something like this? You know, it's a little bit of oil and a stick, and some color and so forth. And that was the birth of the oil pastel. Now, I like to use, to me, this is a very zen tool because it's big, it's fast, it's very medium. And I did these in the, the demonstration in Venice on the 2nd of January, um, demonstrating spontaneous brush techniques combined with oil pastels, and a lot of it was also about color theory, which I'm definitely not going to get into today, and, and textures, and uh, there are some compositional elements as well. And uh, I knew when I did them, they weren't finished. I said to everyone, you know, I can still work on these again later. This, but at any rate, they watched the process. I'm going to pass this around, too, because I want you to feel your object. Now, I put as much as possible, hold it from under here so we don't get fingerprints on it, so you don't get any stuff on your fingers, too. And, uh, and, yeah, and you can look. Yeah, well, that's what I want. I want you to feel this the object. Pounds, right? hmm? This is 300 pound paper. It's 300 pound paper. Oh, 300, water, pound yeah. 300 pound paper. 300 pound paper. Hot press? No. Cold, uh, press. cold press. Hot press paper is smooth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And unless you're doing highly detailed work where you want, where you don't want the paint rolling off into any crevices, you want it to put it exactly right, is then there's not much point in using hot press. If you're doing abstract work where you want happy accidents, where you want of the liveliness and the movement that we talk about in Zen painting, then the cold press is where you want to go. And even go, you can go further than that into torsion, which is an even rougher paper. Wonderfully rough. A lot of people don't know torsion, but it's, there's paper rougher than cold press. It, instead of having little ruts, it's got big ruts, mm -hmm. like, you know, a uh, half an inch across. I'm sorry, could you repeat the word? The torsion. Torsion? T-O-R-C-H-O-N. And it describes very rough watercolor mm -hmm. paper. Amazon. <laughs> when it comes to paper, you, I don't know if you, I don't, never try to find that paper. But um, uh, Sennelier Fa Fabriano um, Artistico is the name of the paper, wherever it's found. Um, <coughs> although this is actually Arsh paper, which is also wonderful. They're both very similar. I mean, the stuff I'm going to use today is the Sennelier Artistico. This day I did the Arsh. And um, this paper is handmade. Um, it has a very special edge. Each sheet is made. It's not made in a roll. It's made one sheet at a time. Okay. So, but anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to do, finish both of these paintings wow. in the next five to six or seven minutes. How do you know? Because I have decided to. <laughs> um, that's how I know. The thing is, this is something I try to teach in my classes, that being an artist is making decisions. So I'm really glad you asked me that question because it gives me the opportunity to point out that making art is a decision. It's all about making decisions. 
I could make the decision not to finish it. Uh, and I would work differently under those circumstances. I would think differently because I would, I would realize that I had to leave room for something else at the very least and uh, leave room for another level, another layer, another thought. Uh, so there's a very big difference. If, if, if you don't make a decision when you go to make a painting, um, you're lost basically because you, you don't know whether it's, what's going to happen or you don't even know what you're trying to do. So it's all about making decisions. Now decision, the decision making process is again being tuned into what's going on. So I'm, when I'm drawing now, I'm going to be making decisions at a very fast rate, but it will be based on what I see. It will be based on what I feel. It will be based on what I think. And it will also be based, by the way, on having some fun. <laughs> the, ultimate, the thing is, in Western painting, the concepts and theories of Western painting are a jumble. That just, a, I wouldn't call it a random jumble, but a jumble of centuries of the random scratchings of various artists. And, and things that have been preserved and not preserved. And many of the greatest arts we know, some of them, you know, in the case of Vermeer, we, we know literally nothing about this man. And he's one of the greatest artists of all time. Um, in China, they're much more into preserving their history than we are in the West. So the thoughts of their early painters going back to even before the year zero are written down and preserved over thousands of years. So there's a whole kind of canon of painting ideas written down, handed on from painter to painter in a continuum, which is quite amazing. And some of these people really were, did live in remote places and were uh, somewhat almost legendary figures, but their words were not tossed aside. They were preserved. And we're not that careful in the West uh, about our artists. We toss them aside along with their writings. So, um, at any rate, so the, within that theory there are there's all kinds of interesting concepts and, there, uh, and levels. And uh, it's so detailed that there's actually a name and a concept and even a philosophy behind every single brush stroke. But you don't think about it. Well, I, I don't work that way. I, I not only don't think about it, but I never studied that and I don't. I, I've studied the principles and I work for the principles. I am, have studiously avoided learning how to paint a chrysanthemum with chrysanthemum strokes, as attractive as it is, and it's wonderfully attractive. Um, but then I would be painting the painting that a thousand other people have already done before, and probably many of them are better than I ever will. I'm interested in doing something uh, that hasn't been done before, so I apply the Eastern principles to Western contemporary art techniques. So, and I'm going to tell a story about recently. I, I've had a very good response from traditional Chinese painters for what I'm doing. That they, that it's okay with them. All these levels and things but uh, and concepts, and it's a kind of hierarchical order of concepts, and there's one at the very top. And in Chinese, it's called Qi Yun Sheng Tong. I know that sounds funny. It's four syllables. Qi, just like Tai Chi. And Yun Sheng Tong. And translated, it means life, resonance, movement. And so, that's, those are kind of abstract words. But basically, what you, we're really talking about, the sense of aliveness, you mentioned the word motion at the beginning of the class. That's really, it's about the painting being alive, from within. Not alive only because I'm alive, and we're alive, but ultimately because it's alive. If it works right, you know, it can go out of this room, I can never see it again, I can forget I ever made it, and it will have a life of its own, and can affect somebody with that life, because the life is really in there, not just because I say it is. Now I'm also going to, I'm going to particularly be interested in strokes that have that are high contrast, okay? And 
Now, I'm not drawing a circle. Okay? But I'm drawing a circle. That's a Zen poem. So, uh, so even though the movements are not circular, but the organization of them is circular. Mm -hmm. Now, this Qi Yun Cheng Tung, this life quality, the only way I can get it in there is if I've got it in me, and if I put it in there. It's not going to get there by itself. If I'm dull and uninvolved, the painting is going to be dull and uninvolved. Hmm. Now the thing is, by the way, this is a concept that I've never done before, too, which is also, you know, to guarantee the spontaneity, so to speak. So I don't really know what it's going to look like, but I know it's going to not look like anything I've ever done before. That's a guarantee, because I've never done it before. And maybe it'll suck. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, Lena, who, Lena, who's photographing this right now, read me one of her notes uh, from one of the classes last year. Okay, and um, it said, oh, great. an artist is someone who can make something he doesn't like, but goes on to make more pieces, doesn't give up, or, or keeps working on that piece. So, that allowed me to make more mistakes in your class. The thing is, everyone wants to, you know, wants to get the Mona Lisa on the first <laughs> shot out of the gate, and that isn't the way it works. And that just discourages a lot of people from ever even becoming painters. And I meet people all the time that say, you know, oh, I can't paint, I can't draw. No, what they can't do is keep going for more than five minutes without getting so down on themselves that they can't take it. Yeah. An artist is someone who can take it and keep going. Like, what is, what is it? Was that Timex? You had us make bad paintings. Make bad paintings. And that was helpful. Yeah. Well, maybe it won't be finished. Maybe I'll have to paint on it again. <laughs> ever play Boggle? Mm -hmm. You know the game Boggle yeah. to work it? Yeah. And you sometimes you have to turn it the other way to be able to see the words. It's a word game where you have to spot words that are hidden. And it's turning into a kind of Christmas read. <laughs> get this, all these are from Jerry's Artorama. Well, the thing is, this is equal to 15 of the small ones. Uh, 11 of the small ones, one big one. There's 11 of the small ones. This is another thing you do. I don't know if this is done, but you have to stop and look at it for a second. You know, if you just keep going, you may take it beyond where you want to. And, uh... It's done. You think it's done? Yeah. Yeah. 
I could see you throwing a little more paint on it. Yeah, well, that's what I would think too. I would add a little paint. But what's interesting is that it, you know, it creates a kind of uh, space in the center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So what happens if you put more paint on? Is that space depth still going to be there? Right. Well, if I if I put paint, I would probably put it on the outside, and I would oh. probably just make it expand and explode a little bit more. So then it would really would be a little a medium bag. And, but there won't be time to do that, but maybe tomorrow. Um, I was going to do two, but I don't need to do two, because we one is enough to demonstrate. But this is showing how a traditional idea from hundreds of years ago in small mountain monasteries in China and Japan could be translated and applied with totally different materials in a totally contemporary way. Just the concept of the Zen circle. And I'm surprised no one has asked yet, but I was expecting the question, well, uh, what does the circle symbolize? Um, so I wrote down some things. Wholeness, completeness, <coughs> perfection, harmony, stillness, fullness, emptiness, infinity, no beginning, no end. Uh, I need to go on for a very long time. It's a, it's a symbol that can contain a great deal. It's certainly a symbol of spirit. 